the regional director of sustainable development for the Latin America and Caribbean region of the World Bank. It's a real pleasure to be here and today to talk about this new report, Nature's Frontiers, Achieving Sustainability, Efficiency, and Prosperity with Natural Capital. The report is the result of a really strong partnership between the World Bank, the Natural Capital Project, and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And we're really grateful to have colleagues from all of those institutions here with us in person and online. It represents several years of work um, in which new models on the cutting edge of science were integrated with big data to examine how we can change the paradigm through which we grow our economies. So over the past hundred years or so, we've really seen a great expansion in economic activity. It's caused unprecedented increases in living standards. We've seen critical indicators like infant mortality and poverty rates plummet throughout the world. We've seen access to basic services like water, sanitation, electricity rising almost everywhere. But that growth has come at a cost, a cost of erosion of the environment. Agricultural growth has relied on expanding our natural forest into our natural forest and intensifying ways we, uh, we work that deplete and pollute our water supplies. And industrial expansion has led to our cities seeing unprecedented rises in air pollution and emissions of greenhouse gases, which are changing the planet's climate. That challenge that the world now faces and one that the World Bank is working to address is to accelerate growth without having that same destruction of the environment. To put it simply, we aim to end extreme poverty, boost shared prosperity at the same time that we contribute to a thriving, livable planet. And what you'll hear about today is that it is possible. We can actually achieve both growth and enhanced human well being while enhancing the environment rather than destroying it. So we can raise incomes, we can address food insecurity, and we can also sequester carbon emissions and protect critical biodiversity. And importantly, this can be done with today's technologies. And the way we can do it is by using our natural capital better, more efficiently and more effectively use our land, our water, and our clean air. So teams from various parts around of the World Bank, including those of my own in Latin America and the Caribbean, are already using this to inform our discussions with government on how to deal with challenges at the intersect of development and climate change. And we're taking this work forward, building on the analysis that we hear about today to better understand what opportunities exist, for example, for the Latin American Caribbean region and move, to move towards a low carbon greener future answering questions like how can countries of the region leverage their natural resources, their land, their forests better for more sustainable development. So what you hear today represents not only a great piece of analytics, but a whole new stream of work at the World Bank with the Natural Capital Project. So now let me turn to Stefan Pulaski and Peter Hawthorne, who are two of the lead researchers at the Natural Capital Project. Stephen is a Regents Professor and the Felser Lambert Chair in Ecology and Environmental Economics at the University of Minnesota. And Peter is the lead scientist with the Natural Capital Project and founder of Nat Cap Insights. We're grateful to have Steve here with us to tell us more about the study and what it means for the future of development and conservation. So we're all ears. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you, those of you online. Uh, so Peter and I are going to uh, basically share the, uh, the presentation here, much as we uh, share the work, and then you'll 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 see who was uh, responsible for the real work when we you see who who does most of the slides. Um, okay, so um, does this advance? There we go. Um, okay, uh, so um, as I said, so Peter and I are going to uh, present. Um, also, we have um, this is this is work amongst uh, a large number of uh, collaborators. Uh, so there's a echo here. Okay, there we go. Good. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, you. You can see them maybe a little bit small on the uh, on the right hand side here. But we have, actually have a number of uh, co-authors also in the room. Um, Okay, so um, as Anna said, there, the sustainable development challenge that we're all facing, we, we need economic development in order to raise people out of poverty, but we need to do this in an environmentally sustainable way or the economic development won't be long lasting. Um, the record of the recent past has not been wonderful in this regard. We've had rapid economic growth, 
um, but poverty remains uh, prevalent. And we've had large declines in natural capital, which has led to the climate and biodiversity crises that we see currently. So the question is, can we do better? And that's really the inspiration and the motivation um, for this work is how do we address these sustainable development challenges of both achieving economic development and doing this in an environmentally sustainable way. Um, so the, the part that we're gonna talk about here is really focused on uh, land use and you know, sort of broadly speaking, how, how do we use our, the, the environment that we find ourselves in um, and this encompasses then uh, any, any action that we take in terms of land use or land management will affect climate, it will affect biodiversity, it will affect uh, livelihoods and income. Um, and so the tools that we're going to talk about are methods that account for the multiple benefits that can come from land use planning, comprehensive land use planning, to improve both the sustainable environmental and economic outcomes. And we stress here that there's multiple ways that countries can attain or meet these uh, multiple objectives. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter now, and he's going to walk us through uh, the sort of the modeling approach. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to start by talking about how we did this analysis. Uh, here's kind of an overview. I'll get into more details. Um, like Steve laid out, we're interested in identifying ways that countries can improve in both environmental and economic measures. And so what we're going to do is look at how they're performing in the current landscape and then consider a range of possible uh, alternative management strategies. On the economic side, we're looking at returns to cropland production, forestry, and grazing, minus any transition costs that are required to reach these lands and use alternatives. Um, and on the ecosystem side, we've looked at carbon storage and emissions from grazing, biodiversity and a number of different metrics and water quality. So we're gonna take those uh, outcomes associated with the different management alternatives, plug them into an optimization and generate a wide range of different alternative land uses, uh, land use patterns for a country that maximize some combination of the economic and the environmental outcomes. And those optimizations are going to basically be the way that we can illustrate where are these uh, opportunities for sustainable development along both of these axes. So the different land use alternatives that we considered in this study, obviously we start with the land as it currently exists. We do impose this set of uh, sustainability constraints. So for example, in areas where uh, there's irrigated cropland, but irrigation is considered unsustainable in the long term, we model that as rain-fed agriculture. There's natural habitat, that's either protection of existing habitat or restoration in areas that have been converted, have forestry production, grazing production, and then uh, intensified crop production. Here we look at this in four different ways. So there's a combination of, uh, is it irrigated or rain fed? And then is it done with or without a set of best management practices? Oops. So then given those alternatives for the way a given parcel of land could be managed, we need to mod model out, well, what would the impacts be on those metrics of interest? So we're starting with uh, the INVEST suite of tools, which is a bunch of models for ecosystem services that uh, are maintained and developed by the Natural Capital Project. And then for this project, we've added in new models globally scoped for grazing, forestry, and biodiversity as well as made improvements and modifications to a large set of the other models that were involved. Um, the inputs, I'm not gonna go through all of them right now, but happy to answer any questions if there are specifics. Basically, we've got uh, globally, mostly spatially explicit models for a set of biophysical and economic data that parameterize these models. And obviously the, the starting land use land management for our current uh, land as it exists. And the outputs from these models basically provide the scores that we use to assess how well a, a given land alternative will perform. And again, I can take questions about, about those or point them to the appropriate person. Here's an example of what some of these look like. So for Brazil, um, the left column of graphs is showing the scores for the landscape as it exists. Uh, the right column of graphs is showing the maximum possible increase that you could get given the appropriate land use choices. And then top to bottom, we've got 
crop returns, grazing returns, timber returns, and then carbon storage and species richness. And the important point here um, is that you can't get all of those maximal increases at the same time. Obviously, if you choose to maximize grazing returns, you're giving up crop returns and a large amount of carbon storage and species richness. So that's where the, the big challenge comes in. How do you select which parcel in which location for which land use? What, which of these objectives you wanna maximize? And then at the, at the national scale, how to coordinate all of those choices for sustainable development pathways. That's where the optimization comes in. So we take all of those model results, plug them into optimization and generate what's called the landscape efficiency frontier. Um, and that's the blue line here. And that represents the best possible combinations of economic value on the x-axis and an environmental value on the y-axis. As to help you orient here, uh, each point on that line represents a different configuration of land. The one up at the top at the left was zero economic value, but a lot of carbon storage, that would essentially be 100% restoration. So going back to the, maybe the original landscape and way down at the bottom right, that's where every parcel of land has been converted to its most economically valuable uh, use. So that would be cropland, grazing, or forestry, depending on the conditions in that parcel. Uh, the pink dot shows our analysis, our assessment of the current landscape. And what we're really interested in, in a lot of cases here, is this no losses zone, or what economists call the Pareto space of this curve. And that's the part that's bounded by the orange dots. So that's where you can see you moving up into the right. And basically, it's a set of land use uh, patterns where there's gain in both the economics and the environmental outcomes for the country. And so what we found is that basically every country has scope to move in that direction. Some it's very limited, some it's very great, um, but the potential is there. And what we really wanted this analysis to do is provide that signpost so countries can move in that direction rather than say the, the business as usual, which would be moving down towards the bottom right, giving up the environmental and focusing purely on the economic. And uh, I'll turn it back to Steve to talk about some of the global patterns we found. Great, thanks. Yeah, so we did this for 146 countries uh, around, uh, around the world, basically all countries above uh, a certain size, 10,000 square kilometers. Um, and uh, that had sufficient uh, uh, data for us to analyze. Um, as Peter said, we, we, we found in almost all countries that there was um, significant room for improvement. Um, that's good. You know, we can both do uh, allow uh, economic development, but do this in a way that actually improves uh, biodiversity and, and, and uh, climate. Um, so just to show you kind of some of the patterns that we found across different countries. So on the upper left uh, is uh, the, the figure for Haiti. Um, Haiti is one of the countries, one of uh, an example of a country for which there are large potential efficiency gains. So we're very far from the frontier. So by reorganizing or uh, reinvesting oftentimes in this, in this particular landscape. So a lot of Haiti has been deforested. It's um, uh, grassland that is not particularly good either for the environment or for economic returns. Uh, so by investing in uh, restoration um, and uh, improving agriculture, we can, we can do better um, on both dimensions. Um, one thing that I'll just mention here is that this analysis is not prescribing to governments exactly what it is that they're going to do. It's saying, here are the potential outcomes, where you want to end up, uh, you know, on the frontier, whether it's more weighted to uh, carbon and biodiversity or more weighted to economic returns is, is not something that we're dictating, but these are, these are laying out the options uh, for countries. Um, the upper right-hand panel, uh, Iceland, shows that not all countries have uh, a, a lot of room uh, for improvement. Um, so in, in Iceland, um, you know, there's not many options actually for land use. Uh, it's it's sort of natural or grazing. And um, so, you know, depending on how much grazing land you have versus how much natural you're moving kind of along that frontier, but there's not, there's not as much room for improvement there. And then the bottom two 
uh, Gabon and Japan are showing kind of um, different patterns. So Gabon, uh, like many countries actually in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, there is currently a lot of natural land. It does very well on the environmental dimension, but not so well on the kind of economic dimension. Um, and so you can see that it's kind of located to the upper left um, of the diagram. And then many developed countries like Japan, as our example here, are in the bottom right. So they're highly, you know, they, they have done very well on the economics. There's not much room for improvement there. But as compared to what Japan looked like before uh, human uh, modification of landscape, you know, there's, there is a lot more room for um, improvement of, of carbon and biodiversity. Um, so those were country by country, but you can take the same idea and think about how does this then stack up uh, globally? So, you know, how much, for example, could we move um, up in the environmental dimension? So how, how much, in this case, how much more carbon could be sequestered um, without adverse economic impact? So this was this no loss idea that Peter talked about. So moving straight up. Uh, we calculate this 85 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide could be sequestered without adverse economic impacts. You could also think about moving to the right in this diagram. So from the current uh, to the yellow dot and showing that there are uh, an increase of over $300 billion without loss to biodiversity or to um, carbon sequestration. Um, this is a map showing that different countries have different orientations. So, you know, if you think Gabon and Japan, so Japan more economically oriented. So the kind of the red tinged countries here are, are sort of more towards the economic side. Um, and then the, the green countries more towards the environmental side. Um, and you can see sort of Latin America, uh, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, more on, on that dimension, obviously Europe, parts, very uh, densely populated parts of Asia, um, more on the, on the um, economically developed side or economically um, oriented side. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Peter. Um, so one question that we commonly get asked and we think is quite important is, the frontier shows you what's possible. It also shows you where you are currently, but how do you go from here to there? Yeah, so thanks. So this is an example from Paraguay, um, coming back to the same frontier I showed earlier. Even within this uh, Pareto space, the, the no losses zone, there's a big difference between those landscapes, how land is being used, what are the outcomes, the, the distribution of economic um, and environmental services. Um, so that's a, a range of choices the country has to make. But even making that choice, these landscapes are very different from the current landscape. So, you know, that the transition from here to there is extreme and basically impossible to, you know, or unrealistic to, to realize in any relevant time scale. Um, so what we've started doing at, at a country specific scale is thinking about, well, how can we use that information to develop more feasible pathways? So here what we've done um, is basically take all of the transitions that would be required to get from the baseline to a, a sort of arbitrarily selected point, and then broken them up into groups of 10% of, of the total parcel transitions that would be required. So each little green dot in there represents 10% of the steps that you could take uh, to complete that transition. So and then what does that look like? I've, you're, I've just identified the, the first three of those steps. So that's representing 30% of the changes from the current towards that uh, optimized landscape. The top row of maps is showing what does the land use pattern look like along those transitions. Generally green is natural habitat and uh, yellow or orange is agricultural habitat, uh, not habitat, but agricultural uses. The bottom row is showing well, what's actually changing in each step. So the green regions are places that we've targeted for restoration of some type and the yellow uh, regions are those that were targeted for intensification of some type. And so you can see that, you know, that represents a much more approachable combination of actions that could be implemented in a, say, a five or 10 year plan targeted with the right policies or incentives. 
uh, and investments. And all told, those first three steps are getting us 65% of the potential gains uh, from of the complete transition and 61% of the gains of the complete transition for carbon storage. So this is representing you know, a pretty significant movement in the direction of sustainable development without the complete transformation of the country that the fully optimized solution entailed. Um, and of course, there's, you know, this is just the straight line transition that we constructed. There could be different ways of tailoring that in implementation to reflect regional priorities or a preference for uh, prioritizing uh, one objective over another initially. So this is just a, an illustration of the way that this information could be used then in, in conversation with uh, a country or region to help plot out uh, a more, more on the ground approachable way to use this information. Um, some of the panelists will talk more about how this information is already being used. This is just an introduction. Uh, and I'll hand it back to Steve to wrap up. So what we've uh, done in this report is to uh, assemble methods that we, uh, uh, and basically data at, at national levels to address some of these uh, global challenges, sustainable development challenges. Um, the analysis that supports these national efforts, uh, in fact, can add up uh, to have global scale impacts. But one of the really important things here is not to consider economic development in isolation or not to consider just um, nature-based solutions in, in isolation, but to think about um, the package together. And that by doing so, in fact, uh, what we've shown here is that it is in fact possible to do far better to address sustainable development challenges by looking at this kind of integrated, um, integrated approach. And with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap up this portion and I'm going to um, uh, turn it over and, and introduce uh, Mary Ruckelshaus, who's the executive director of the Natural Capital Project. And she's gonna uh, uh, help us lead a panel. Thank you, Steve and Peter. Um, how are we doing on time? We're okay, so we could, I think we could have um, time for a few just clarifying questions for Steve and Peter. What the, the rest of the time here together, we'll have a, a panel with our two guests online and three here, and then we'll open it up to the audience for a QA, and a the online audience and the in-person. So there's time for more interpretive questions at the end, but if you have clarifying questions for Steve or Peter, please, either the online community or, or in the room, anybody. Hi everyone. Um, so on the chart, you were um, showing a trend line that has a negative correlation between the net economic value and the environmental value. Were you able to take into account any situations that might like have a, they both like a situation where both uh, the economic and the environmental value are benefited? Yeah, I'll start. Great question. Um, so, so partly what we show is when you get to the frontier, that's where there are kind of, we, we've exhausted the kind of doing well on both. From the current to the frontier, in fact, that's highlighting the, the point that there are wins for the environment as well as um, for the economy. The other aspect of that question now is um, th thinking about um, sort of the sustainability. So, so one can imagine that, you know, for example, if you push too far in the uh, economic development or intensifying that you might have, um, unwittingly crossed, for example, a threshold in the environment, a tipping point in the environment, uh, that somehow you, 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 don't have, you have not retained enough habitat and so biodiversity would, would go. Um, that's why we actually emphasize the, um, the no net loss. So, because kind of the, the further you are to the extremes that, that Peter was showing, kind of the, the more likely it is that you have missed something important like that. And so, you, you know, you say, oh, I'm going to develop but that's undermining the natural capital, which is actually in, <laughs> important for maintaining both the environment and the economic development. Um, so, uh, but within the within the space of saying no net loss on the environmental side, 
you know, we, we hope that we are avoiding those kinds of unsustainable development paths, but excellent question. Yeah. I just add one thing to that. So one, one thing that we did find is a lot of cases uh, that the, the choice of landscape management that was being preferred was intensified cropland with BMPs. So that best management practices, sorry, which in our, this case included uh, addition of riparian buffers and ma maintenance of about 10% habitat mixed in with cropland. So that's a case where at the local scale, if you can close yield gaps, but then also set aside land, that represents a choice of land use that provides benefits along both axes. So that shows up in a lot of the optimizations. Yeah. Hi, I also thank you for this. It, for me, uh, it's, it's very exciting to see this piece of the, the analysis that we need to get to a sustainable future. I work in the energy side of things. And um, I'm wondering about timeline because in a climate heating world, that matters immensely. And then I'm looking, you know, we talk about economics, but in the end that's caught, like where, how do we balance the cost of whether it's reforestation or restoration, um, how do we, I don't want to say justify because I could justify any of this, but how do you, how do you uh, produce the data in a way that is, is sustainable in terms of its own economics? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start. Great question. So I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start on two parts and then come back if I haven't um, addressed kind of the, the complete suite of your question. But um, the first one on the on the timing. So certainly if you're restoring forest, you're talking about decades as opposed to if you're destroying forest, you're talking about pretty quick. Um, so um, one of the things that we're doing now, it's not uh, highlighted in this report is, is to think about um, the time frame of when do you get the carbon stored? And as you rightly point out, that matters. We, we need this nearer term rather than longer term. So um, many of the switches, other than other than reforestation, you know, so many of the things happen fairly quickly. But but you're exactly right on the on the reforestation question. And so um, in these frontiers, we're looking at what we call sort of a steady state, or like if if it's transitioning from agriculture to forest, like here is the amount of land, uh, here's the amount of carbon that would be stored in that forest once it gets to its, its mature, but that could take you know, 50, 60, 80 years. So uh, it's an important point. The other aspect um, that you raised is, is, is really getting to, um, I think, getting to the distribution. Like if we say, oh, this land is gonna transition in this way, how do we make sure that the particular landowners or the particular people involved are, um, are being made whole? And so, um, one good thing about the analysis is that it is spatially explicit and we're you know, knowing exactly what happens and we've got the economic returns. So this does in practice have to be put with institutions and like, are there gonna be policies that for example, pay for ecosystem services? Um, um, and that's a, a, a whole additional set of questions which are extremely important, but yeah, great, great points. Yeah, so something that we've started doing with that transition path analysis also is that that's giving us a more explicit timeline of which changes are happening where on the landscape. And we've been able to quantify then not, not only the, the trajectory of economic value that's being produced, but also what would be the sequestration rate of the areas that have been reforested. So we can add in another constraint there to say, well, let, we need to maintain at least this level of in, like instantaneous sequestration. So it starts to account for that. Um, and then it could be part of the country's balance sheet on their, for their carbon modeling, yeah. Okay, there's some really interesting questions coming online. Um, some of them are application related questions that if we, I'm gonna ask the more um, sort of detailed methods questions here and I might have to put some to the end, but we'll get to all of these. One question is, a group of countries in Central Asia are not covered by the analysis. 
and what would it take to include them and what data are, might be missing? Yeah, we, we, we originally had all of the countries in Central Asia um, and at one point, uh, so I can tell you very specifically what, what kind of knocked them out was actually um, our agricultural models and in particular uh, knowing where irrigated and unirrigated um, land was and um, the yields. So basically improving the agricultural model um, data uh, there would um, basically get us over the over the hump uh, for most of the um, Central Asian um, countries. Th there were a couple of other uh, smaller issues in various places, but that was the basic one for, um, uh, for you know, places like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and so forth. I mean, the good news is we, we have, most of this is globally available data. So when we have the land cover, which we have, um, and we have the, we, we have access to the uh, carbon models and we can apply the biodiversity models. So, so mostly we, um, it's not like we couldn't do anything there. It was just one of the models. Okay, another good one. For the grazing model, have you looked at possibilities where regeneration could be combined with intensification? And that this person notes the regenerative grazing practices in communal rangelands as an example. Yeah. That's a great question. So um, we, um, you know, when Peter talked about the agricultural crops, we, we uh, talked about various different ways. So it's not just cropland or not cropland. There's various different management strategies. For grazing and forestry, um, we were more limited in the study in the sense that we didn't have the kind of globally available data that would allow us to evaluate many of the, like, you know, the regenerative uh, grazing that, that's just mentioned. Um, it's certainly on our agenda. We would love to be able to talk about both in grazing and forestry, um, the same kinds of, you know, not just is it on or off, but what kind of grazing and what kind of forestry is there? So, you know, there could be, just as within agriculture, there could be additional ways in which we can do things smarter by considering more of these kinds of options, but we didn't have the data or the understanding at the, to do this globally at the time. Two more, and then we're gonna move on um, for now. One, another good question is, did the mapping exercise take into consideration the proximity of processing facilities for wood or agricultural products? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, did we, did we can't, so we had transportation costs in there. So we, we know where the particular land parcel is. We also know where um, uh, uh, cities and towns are and where, you know, how, how long it would take you to get there. So we did do that kind of transportation cost. Um, the thing we did not have globally was, you know, we didn't know, for example, where um, meat processing facilities were globally. So we, we have an assumption about how far are you away from basically a market center? And that's how we factored in um, transportation costs. It would be, you know, most of these things, the, the principles are pretty straightforward. So if you have better data, like if we actually had a global map of here are where processing facilities are and the capacities of those processing facilities, we could, we could do a, a, a more refined uh, approach on that. I'm going to do one more pretty detailed technical one. And there are a few questions I will not forget, but we'll come back to them at the end. Um, and so this last technical question is, what new components or attributes were included relative to the existing INVEST models, or was this analysis made outside INVEST? That's, that's probably for Adrian and Peter and Steve. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll start with that. Um, the, the grazing and forestry models were completely new for this project. Um, the biodiversity model, I don't think we use the invest model at all, right? No, so that was that was assembled from, I think I the slide is gone, but there's a, a list of a bunch of different metrics that went into that. And then we combined those into a, a single index. Um, I think we rebuilt 
uh, a remote sensing based land carbon model. So it's sort of using the same framework that the invest model does, but re rebuilt with the, the most up to date data we could find. Uh, the cropland yield model was also sort of updated for this project. Um, the water quality model was the, the invest model, but modified to be able to run in with the global extent, which is a pretty Herculean uh, computing uh, project. I don't know. Of the cost. The yeah, cost of that's right. And then all of, all of the economics data to, to get the cost, transportation, um, the transition costs, so cost of irrigation, cost of restoration. That was all new data that was assembled. Um, I'll just head off a question that I know I'm being asked later, which is which of this data is available <laughs> since we're on the subject of data now. Um, we're basically trying to get everything organized in a way that's uh, usable and accessible for people. And then um, it'll be put online. So the base input data and then the sampling of the, the landscapes along the frontier will be downloadable at some point. Uh, so all of this, uh, yeah. Hopefully, people have access to and be able to make use of. Thank you so much, Steve and Peter. So now I would like to call up the panel members, please. And we're going to start this session with our two patiently waiting online experts. Um, who are here at all hours of the night, especially Johnny. Thank you so much for joining us at such a late hour. And that what I'll do is I'll introduce each person and ask them one just prompt question just to get their initial thoughts out. And then what we'd love to do is have a little bit of an exchange after each panel member has pre presented a few introductory remarks then have an exchange among the panel members for a few minutes. And then we would open it back up to those of you in the room and online. So for those of you online who have questions that we haven't gotten to, we will work hard to get to them in the Q&A after this panel. So first I'd like to introduce Gianni Ruta, the lead environmental economist for the World Bank. Um, welcome, he's joining us from Beijing. And Johnny, can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on this work based on how it's been implemented in China? And also you've been with this analysis since the beginning. So you've seen the whole arc of it in interesting ways that's probably unique. So yeah, please please share with us what you think about this in terms of the implementation. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for having me. This is a truly exciting event because it's the culmination of many hours uh, of work by many brains. So um, I, in the middle, as you said, in the middle of the process, I I moved to Beijing, uh, and uh, and China is an amazing story, right? GDP that grows. Uh, over a long period, 40 years at uh, an average of 9.5% per year uh, is, uh, is extraordinary. And the same is, uh, is the degradation that this, uh, this rapid growth caused. Things changed recently in China with the, with the concept of ecological civilization that uh, is now enshrined in the constitution. And with the Chinese Academy of Sciences here, a long time partner of the Natural Capital Project and the Natural Capital Project itself, we started to think, what does it, what can this tool, the production possibility frontier do for, the, for this concept of ecological civilization? So the methodology we use is the same that you, that Peter and Stephen uh, nicely presented. The data is actually drawn from uh, the massive China National Ecosystem Assessment that was carried out between 2000 and 2015. Uh, and, uh, and, and what does the data show? We, we, took at, uh, the, we looked at this from three novel point of view. Basically, we built on the work uh, that was done in, the, in this global report. And then the first piece of novelty is to look at the evolution of China over time, because the data span 2000 to 2015, 
uh, we could see whether China was actually moving towards the frontier, away from it, or, or parallel, let's say, to the frontier. And in fact, it was moving towards the frontier. Uh, we looked actually that our two dimensions were food production uh, versus ecosystem services. And we looked at uh, uh, four different ecosystem services. Food production increased dramatically over 34%. Ecosystem services like soil retention, water, water retention uh, went up. Wildlife habitat uh, decreased slightly over, over this period. So that already gives us a sense of how you can use the frontier to assess historic trends. The second thing you can do is to assess the present and, and your current policies. So what we did, we took a two of the key policies that China is putting in place. The first one is the concept of ecological conservation red lines that established the no-go areas for development, essentially. And we, we, we checked whether uh, implementing those ecological conservation red lines would, have, would move China in what direction. And same we did with the, a more stringent concept of spatial conservation, which is the ecological areas defined by the Ministry of Natural Resources. And, uh, and in both cases, there is an increase in efficiency. So China becomes more efficient by implementing these policies. But one of the two, the, the more stringent one, actually comes with a trade-off embedded. It moves, it reduces food production, actually. So implementing these ecological objectives can come at a cost uh, in terms of other economic variables. And the other key point that we looked at is uh, what happens in the other key points of the frontier. If we want to maximize carbon sequestration, China has uh, an ambition to, to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. You know, how much can nature-based solutions of this kind offer? So the movement, the vertical movement straight up to the frontier, uh, when you measure carbon sequestration on the vertical axis, shows that you can reach 34% increase in carbon sequestration. And that, that increase actually means 10% of uh, offset emission by in 2019, more or less, but it also means 35%, over 35% of uh, offset emissions in year 2050. So nature-based solution, by the time you approach that carbon neutrality year, uh, become very, very important. And that movement to the frontier, that plus 34% becomes super important. There was a question in the chat about biodiversity. We also looked at, at an additional constraint. What if we impose uh, the constraint of protecting 30% of the most biodiverse land in, in the territory and still try to maximize carbon sequestration. Still, we managed to get an increase in carbon sequestration of about 20%. Uh, the other thing we did that is new compared to the global report is looking at uh, provinces and where the trade-offs or synergies are stronger. One of the provinces in the Northeast, Elongziang, faces the most difficult choices because they have high agriculture potential, high biodiversity and carbon sequestration potential, and those come, come, uh, uh, may come at odds. So overall, in summary, uh, the, the type of analysis, and I hope I'm giving you the flavor of that, uh, shows one, in the case of China, China is not far from the frontier. Uh, it's highly transformed landscape. So moving, improving ecological outcomes means potential trade-offs. So intensification uh, and technological progress is crucial, uh, but that can come with other environmental costs and they need to be checked. Now, synergies between carbon sequestration and biodiversity are there, are possible, and, uh, and, and the analysis shows that. So, so implementing this dual agenda of carbon neutrality with biodiversity is, is possible and spatial analysis can help inform that. And finally, the, the, the production possibility frontier treats efficiency as a spatial allocation issue, which basically means that if you think about winners and losers among provinces, you could start thinking even in terms of, uh, of trading schemes in which efficiency in a way gets traded across provinces. I'll stop there. Sorry, sorry if I <laughs> speak too much about China, but this is this is a, a great tool that can be applied in many many different ways uh, in uh, in every country. Wonderful, Gianni. No, that's we could just listen to you all all night for you, um, but we'll come back to you because there's a, such a wonderful, rich example in what China's done to essentially downscale this approach. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to turn next to Dr. Carl Folke, who's the chair of the board and the co-founder 
of the Stockholm Resilience Center. And he's the director of the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Um, and you have just wonderful perspective about resilience and transforming people's thinking and societies, Carl. So please, we're eager to hear from you. Thanks a lot, Mary, and uh, really nice to be with you. Uh, I think this is extremely exciting. I think this report is, um, is almost like a milestone of, of really showing the, the synergies between economic development and, and uh, good stewardship of, of the planet's uh, ecosystem and ecosystem services. So, so, so I think it's so, it's so very different from the way the economic world has normally looked at, at uh, incorporating a few things, a few services as externalities in, into the economic model to, to really illustrate now that the work of, of natural capital uh, and ecosystems is is really foundational for for economic uh, development, uh, and, and I think this report extremely well clarifies that both in the space of in the space of health, agricultural production, water use, and all these things. So, so in that sense, I think it's a really really sorely needed. Uh, if we would have had it uh, 30, 40 years ago, so we are, had been more prepared for the changes coming now. But it's excellent that it's happening, and I think it will have a big big impact. So, so what I'm trying to say here is actually I think that it can speed up the ongoing mind shift in mindsets that we are witnessing right now I think from from before looking at at the environment as something outside society to, to an increased recognition that if the planet and its biosphere doesn't work really well it will be hard for us to continue with a good civilization and a good economic development. And I think this report is really uh, increasing the speed of, of, of uh, that transition, which is uh, happening right now. And it is happening actually, as you all know, very much so in the financial sector, which to me has been a, a fantastic uh, surprise. If you go back 10, 15 years, it wasn't hardly there, but now in just in the last two, three and five years, things are really starting to move. And as you, Ivani, you mentioned nature-based solutions and these type of, of approaches, and we have new task forces and on nature financial disclosures and these type of things. But I think what this report does in, uh, enhances the significance of, of not looking at nature-based solutions in, in sectors or in certain domains, but really having this more systemic overview of, of what it means to be to revitalize. To, to revitalize the environment for economic development. I think that that to me is a really foundational contribution of this of this uh, work. I think Steve talked about it as as the package of nature and the economy together. but I think it's really about showing the significance and the potential of of uh, revitalizing uh, natural capital for our own uh, progress and prosperity. So so the, these are two two dimensions of the report that I find extremely uh, nice and extremely well uh, well done and and um, the whole approach with the methods and the tools that are developed is is uh, makes it very practical and it makes it very usable for a lot of actors in society. Thank you very much. Well, Carl, thank you so much. It's really important to remember the the shift in mindsets that are underway and that we need to accelerate, as you're saying, as well as the, the very practical arguments that we can make to, to make that happen. So we will come back to you as well when we come to the Q&A and the discussion among panel members. So can we now please have Adrian and Juha and Nancy come join up here in the seats and we'll have some opening remarks from these three panel members, and then we will have a little discussion. So I'd next like to turn it to Dr. Adrian Vogel, who's a lead scientist for the Natural Capital Project, and also has been um, with the World Bank um, seconded for the last two years, so has a, a great perspective on this work. And can you, can you talk a little bit, Adrian, about what entry points you see for this work and how it might influence 
development finance in general. Well, thanks, Mary, and thanks, Peter and, and Steve, for excellent presentation. And I was really uh, honored to be part of the team that put together this, this report. And, and so, yeah, I'm speaking from my experience working with the Natural Capital Project for over a decade, um, working a lot with different countries in Latin America, and then more recently with the World Bank through the Biodiversity Ecosystems and Landscape Assessment Initiative, um, which aims to bring these kinds of tools within reach of project uh, managers and the countries that they work with to, to make these tools more useful for designing development projects for informing the dialogue with the country governments. Um, so speaking from that perspective, I, I am also a pragmatist. And so I really love that this work is academic and is really well grounded in science, but also to me has some really practical applications. And I just wanna to touch on a few of those briefly. Um, first of all, I um, one thing that uh, was not emphasized much in the presentation is that also each of these um, frontier points includes an estimate of transition costs or implementation costs. And so what that means then in, in a practical sense is that you can you know, look at this no loss zone, these no, this, this no loss zone of options and can not only set a certain level of ambition for, uh, in a country for where they, what they could achieve in terms of economic or environmental improvement without loss in other dimensions, um, can not only set that ambition, but have a clear sense of what it might cost for, to implement that policy to get there, which along with an analysis of, of funding gaps, you know, can give you a sense of what is the financing need to begin to make those steps towards the frontier. Um, secondly, another really interesting application of this kind of approach is that um, you taking all of those no loss options together, because this is uh, spatially explicit modeling, we can also see sort of parcel by parcel or place by place in a country, which are the zones that are most often recommended to be restored or most often recommended to be intensified in agriculture, regardless of, of where exactly you choose to be on that frontier. So we can produce thing called like an agreement map, which says, what's the level of agreement around the recommended actions in specific places? And this sort of information is really useful um, and in fact, I'm uh, using a similar analysis right now with some colleagues at the World Bank working with the government of Pakistan to help them develop a national action plan for restoration using this kind of approach to say, where are the places where, um, you know, regardless of exactly what your target is, the places most often that give you the biggest benefits for restoration in almost all the scenarios. And those are the places then that the government can target in their national restoration plans. Um, Let's see, so just really briefly going through a couple of other examples. Um, uh, my mind just went blank, I'm sorry. But one thing that I uh, did wanna to touch on is also the project level design. So when you're actually looking at investment projects, again, this is a national scale analysis, but you can zoom in because it's spatial. You're not limited to only looking at a national scale. So we've also used similar approaches and, and results um, uh, from these kinds of models to look at, at a regional scale or subnational scale, how do you design a project for say, investing in landscape restoration, investing in payments for ecosystem services schemes, um, or investing in you know, a, a, a joint projects, you know, a way to, to build dialogue between the agricultural community uh, or the agricultural sector and the forestry sector and how can you design a project that will um, improve the condition of landscapes while, while reaching both of these sectors. And so from a sort of a, a, a investment project design perspective, I think that these, these tools are also really, really useful. I've totally forgot what my other example was, but I think I'm have used enough time, so I'll stop there. <laughs> yes, and we will come back to you, so no problem. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'd next like to turn to Nancy Lozano Gracia, the lead economist in the Latin America and Caribbean region for the World Bank. And can you share with us, Nancy, what potential impacts you see for implementing this, this into your work in the World Bank? Thanks. Uh, well, I'm, I have to say that I'm super excited to, to be here. I think the potential impact that this work can have is uh, sky is the limit. I think we've heard several examples already. 
But I think focusing on Latin American countries, I think uh, this work can actually, one, one important contribution is that as we've heard in the presentation and the interventions before, it can help shift the discussion from a discussion when we usually focus on, okay, if we want to conserve natural capital, there is a trade-off. I think this work is actually helping us shift that conversation to an area of opportunities, to an area where we don't necessarily have to go into losses of natural capital or economic growth or give up um, carbon sequestration. There is what this work I think is pointing at is there is an area of opportunity and there are possibilities to think about improving these three outcomes without sacrificing uh, on, on the others. Um, so I think that puts this conversation or it helps us have a very strong conversation with our, our counterparts. I think the point that you mentioned just now, it also allows us to have a stronger conversation that is cross-sectoral. So if we're focusing on natural capital, we often focus on a discussion with Minister of Environment. This allows us to bring Minister of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, Minister of Finance at the table to start discussing what are opportunities for lack. This is particularly important because um, emissions in Latin America and the Caribbean, 47% of emissions are actually coming from agriculture, from land use change, from deforestation. So thinking about how to move towards a low carbon path will have to or will require actions on better land use management, start thinking about how to better leverage climate smart agriculture technologies or intensification, and also um, how to leverage forests for uh, carbon sinks. So I, I think for lack, it's uh, very, very important. But if we focus also on Amazon countries, I think there's immense potential of using these tools to, um, to really think about how is it that Amazon countries can move closer to the frontier very fast. I think this goes back also to the point that was discussed uh, in the question on, on time. Uh, I, I think that's something that maybe needs to, um, as a follow-up, it's important to think about. We know that the, um, that the Amazon is at a very high risk of achieving a tipping point. So bringing that dimension is going to be very important and starting a conversation now with Amazon countries on how to protect uh, natural capital, sensitive natural capital, while also not sacrificing economic growth is going to be um, very important. I think these paths, these incremental steps that uh, Peter was showing in, in his discussion um, are gonna be very useful to start having the conversation on what needs to be done and where the spatial differentiation on the prioritization. We know uh, we were all um, in the discussion also, uh, you were pointing at what is going to need to happen for those steps to be able to be taken. And I think these kind of analysis can help us start a conversation, but also very fast move to the how and to the where is it that this needs to happen. And in that, um, in our work, we've, we've, um, we've already identified what are priorities on the how. We know that uh, these Amazon countries will have to scale up action in terms of land use management and forest conservation. We'll have to start thinking very fast about what are options for economic opportunities that can replace illegal actions in terms of lodging or mining that are destroying the Amazon, but also actions to complement and um, and improve the living standards of people living in the Amazon. So these are kind of the these are the discussions that this work can initiate, and then we can start very fast 
uh, discussing with countries how to move in that trajectory. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. And we'll, we'll be able to come back to all of these wonderful points you're making. So we'd like to turn to Juha. So Juha um, is the chief economist at the IUCN and um, brings a really rich diversity of experience, but also perspective, especially on the biodiversity from the biodiversity community. So Juha, we'd love to hear how do you see this work being used for the broader community that's interested in biodiversity and sustainable development questions? Thanks, Mary, and, and uh, thanks, uh, Stephen and Peter, and, and, and to all authors of this report uh, for uh, a great piece of work. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start out by noting at the outset that uh, in conservation community, I think it's generally recognized and has been generally recognized for quite some time that uh, sustainable economic development is not possible if it doesn't incorporate the uh, conservation of nature. And on the other hand, conservation of na nature in a sustainable ways is not possible if it doesn't integrate economic development. So this has been kind of ingrained in, in work of by IUCN and others for many, many years. It goes back to all the, all the way back to probably Stockholm uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the 70s and IUCN World Conservation Strategy in, in published in 1980. So this has been recognized as a challenge. How to put this into practice? this simple uh, challenge that we all face is very difficult. And I think this report in, it, in its uh, robustness and, and rigorous analysis and comprehensiveness can re represent a, uh, an important milestone in making progress in integrating economic development and conservation. So it, I think it's, a, it's, an, it's an extremely important and valuable piece of work. To highlight the uh, potential uses of this work around the world, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, global biodiversity framework that was just agreed uh, in Montreal, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So all countries, almost all countries in the world agreed uh, to 23 targets uh, under four different goals to achieve sustainable development. And in the longer, longer run by 2050, the goal of uh, living in harmony with nature. And uh, there's a number of linkages here. And I, I, I recognize that the linkages are not just the global biodiversity framework, but I think they, the linkages represent well the different uses, potential uses of this work. So I'm going to highlight four, uh, four, four areas. The first goal, under the first goal, the first target in, in the framework has to do with um, call for integrated and biodiversity inclusive spatial planning uh, across the world uh, in a way that then would bring in the loss of uh, areas of high biodiversity importance close to zero by 2030, while at the same time recognizing the rights uh, of indigenous peoples and uh, local communities. And here, I think it's quite uh, obvious to us that this, this work that you've, uh, you've made, done here can be directly applied uh, to the principles of spatial uh, planning. We, we also recognize that one needs complementary approaches to, to include and, and incorporate the rights of indigenous peoples and, um, and local communities, but uh, if one can address the spatial dimension, it, it, we're already a long way uh, making progress. Now, the second target or targets uh, that are relevant here have to do with the restoration and uh, pr protected areas. So the restoration target, target two in the framework, uh, calls for a restoration of minimum 30% of degraded uh, ecosystems by 2030. And the famous uh, target three, 30 by 30, calls for the expansion of protected areas in all ecosystems, terrestrial and other ecosystems, to 30% uh, to of, the, of their total area by 2030. And here, the key question, of course, is how do we achieve this in a way that is maximally effective for biodiversity, climate, and economy? And again, your results and data here can directly help countries decide where and even how they should go about restoring their ecosystems and where, especially, uh, you know, especially you know, where, where they, was, they should establish protected areas. So that then in the end, uh, the combination uh, aligns well with climate goals, biodiversity goals, and economic goals. The, uh, the third area uh, of, uh, of global biodiversity framework where your, your work can be very important has to do with, do with resource mobilization. And the kind of the underlying motivation in resource mobilization strategy for global biodiversity framework is that all economic activities should be aligned with biodiversity and climate goals. And here, again, the linkage is direct. It's this, this thinking, this concept is built right into your models. It's also uh, more specifically uh, uh, in, the, in the resource mobilization strategy, 
there's a call and a commitment to repurpose uh, reform current subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity so that they become biodiversity neutral or biodiversity positive. This is a major goal, includes about $500 billion worth of subsidies to be reformed per year. How to, how to achieve this will be difficult from social perspective, economic perspectives, but in order to do, make progress there, I think your work again can highlight how do we go about that reform in a way that is uh, positive, uh, effective uh, for climate biodiversity and economic activities. And I think that that's sort of a final point that I want to make here is that the, I think there, there's a recognition that we need to reform economies so that they incorporate uh, biodiversity and climate in a very integrated fashion that all, not just conservation spending is aligned with, with, with biodiversity, rather all economic activities, activities need to be aligned. And I think your work uh, is, is an important uh, uh, step in, in helping countries make that goal, meet that goal. So in some, um, the results here are, are, are important and, and insightful, but I might think that uh, in the long run, uh, it might be this sort of uh, additional uh, follow-up uh, analysis and, 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 uh, and, and uh, policy decisions and evaluations that your data and approaches enables that might, might be equally, if not more important in the long run. Thanks very much again. Uh, that that I mean, all of your everybody's comments are there's so much richness here, but I think your last point is very well taken, and that's what I think some of these country uh, applications are going to start to unearth. So that's that's a really good point. Okay, so we have a a few minutes now just for the panel members to interact with one another, and there were so many really good points that were made. I wonder. Johnny, Carl, Adrian, Nancy, Juha, would you like to just react to what one another has said or ask each other questions? Please, this is a chance for us to talk among ourselves a little bit before we open it up to a Q&A with the larger audience. I could, I could just stress again what uh, Nancy said, said there about uh, shifting from trade-offs to opportunities. I think that's really, that's really key. Uh, key contribution of this report to really highlight the complementarity of of nature and economic development, which which is uh, which is very important and and absolutely needed to to create enthusiasm and inspiration for for redirecting and transforming the way we do our business on the planet today into more sustainable futures. Yes. Oh, I see Johnny's raising his hand. Thanks, go ahead, Nancy, go ahead. <laughs> to say something that relates to, to your points, Johnny, because you were uh, talking about um, the provinces in China and how, um, if I understood correctly what you're saying, how objectives from the, uh, from the provinces may differ from the objectives of the country as a whole. And I think that's a very interesting point and one that I'm actually uh, very happy that we'll be working with the NADCAP team as a follow-up of, of this work with a focus on, on the Amazon, because that's also a, a region where one could think that individual objectives for countries would uh, maybe different if we think about the objectives of conserving or preserving the region or what or an efficiency frontier for the region as a whole. So I think this is very important for regional analysis as well and to start pointing at areas where the individual and regional objectives differ and then start asking, how is it that regional coordination, for example, can lead to more efficient, uh, to a higher efficiency frontier? Or where is it that we need to start thinking about payment schemes to compensate countries to achieve an objective that they will not be willing to achieve on their own? And who is it that would need to put money on the table? So I think these, can, these work it will be very useful to inform those discussions. I wanted I wanted to insist on the uh, on the same point. So, but Nancy put it so much nice my, in a much nicer way than me. 
Uh, so I will not repeat it. Uh, but uh, just to stress this idea of, uh, of the opportunity, uh, it, it actually can vary uh, uh, a lot by country. And, and one, one part of the presentation from Stephen and, and Peter showed that you know, when, when you get to, to highly transformed countries, very often those countries are, are not far from the frontier already. So they, 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 that's where the trade-offs are, are biggest. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's really a challenge there because if you want to improve uh, ecological outcomes, whether it's carbon sequestration or, uh, or uh, biodiversity, then, then you, you, you're facing some, uh, some trade-off or you have to push the frontier out. So identifying where those, uh, those elements are and then adding the spatial analysis by looking at the specific locations is, uh, it can, can give rise to a very rich, uh, very rich agenda. And, and, and just to echo also the, the point that uh, uh, Juha was mentioning in terms of uh, the, the integration between the climate and the biodiversity agenda, uh, the, 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 tool, the tool here allows you to look at, at that additional uh, dimension of the problem. No? When, you, when, you, when you want to, to protect the most uh, biodiverse and really thanks to uh, uh, Gretchen Daly for, for helping uh, this team a lot on, on that uh, and the team on, on, that, on that aspect. Uh, when you want to protect the most valuable biodiversity areas, then, then you, you, you can do uh, that selection of location spatially and, and see what, what then your possibilities are at that point, what your Pareto improvements really look like. Uh, and, and then when it comes to reforming incentives, you can link and there's probably some of the protagonists of this world, you can link this work to an economic model and, uh, and see how, how then that gets translated into uh, uh, not only economic performance, but also how economic policies can change then the movements towards the frontier. Okay, I'll just ask one more question to, to prompt all of you and then Juha, anything you'd like to add? There are several questions coming up online, and all of you have touched on the unique spatial aspect of this analysis, which can help mediate potentially trade-offs, but also help sharpen visions for a region or a country or even a subnational scale. And there are questions about how do we incorporate diversity, distribution, and equity issues into this. And Adrian, I know you have perspectives on that. So would you like to start there and then we can pass it along to your colleagues? Yes, I mean, I think that's a really critical point because with the trade-off curves that, that we were seeing in this presentation are really focused on the environmental benefit versus the um, economic benefit, but, we, but the environmental benefit and the economic benefit can both be further disaggregated, you know, depending on how those benefits are distributed spatially and among different members of society. And so in reality, when it goes to, when you go to implement each of the steps along the way, you're likely to, to have, countries are very likely to face these issues of trade-offs in, in equity issues. But I think that, um, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of having this, this spatial approach is that you can overlay information about um, you know, demographics, access to, to water treatment, for example. You know, we've done this kind of thing in a, a similar study in Costa Rica a few years ago using some of the same approaches when they were a little bit more nascent in our, <laughs> in our minds, um, where we looked at uh, uh, helping the government design their, uh, I'm trying to remember what the acronym stands for, but it's the nationally appropriate mitigation actions in the agricultural sector to help them achieve their NDCs. And in addition to the targets of improving water quality, uh, reducing erosion control, improving water regulation, we also looked at where, um, where people depend on or which people have access to treated water. So the areas where you had greater benefit for water purification services, were greater where people don't have access to treated water currently. For example, um, biodiversity services you know, were greater in areas that were highly dependent economically on tourism. Those kind of things can all be incorporated 
Um, but I think that in the end, it gets also back to the point that Steve made early on that that no amount of scientific analysis and data crunching is ultimately going to be able to make a political decision for you. You know, you have to, the, what we're doing is making decisions more transparent, providing information then that if we can get, you know, numbers and, and, and data that people agree on, then you can have the dialogue in a very open and transparent way about what social and, and equity types of trade-offs you might be facing and then how you can make it right for the people that might be um, potentially disadvantaged in some of these policies. So Juha, you'll have the last word and then we'll open it up to questions and further discussion with the group. So please. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, I had a question, but let, let me let me actually re respond to, uh, to this uh, previous question and, and then go back to my question later if need be. On this issue of trade-offs, so certainly, uh, um, we'll have spatial trade-offs uh, within uh, the economic trade-offs, clearly, and um, they may not be spatial. They might also be trade-offs between different socioeconomic groups. And we, we of course, don't have uh, clear answers and guidance how to exactly go about uh, addressing those trade-offs. But maybe the, the best we can do, at least, or the least we can do, is uh, make those trade-off discussions based on data and the same data, preferably, so that the different parties can uh, reflect on them uh, in a meaningful way and make progress. Hopefully there will be a local national level process that would then, uh, then incorporate them in. Um, one dimension where we find uh, at IUC and uh, helpful to, to, to make these trade-offs explicit uh, beyond spatially explicit data is between socioeconomic groups and especially indigenous peoples and local communities, oftentimes uh, highlighting uh, the outcomes that are specific to, specific to them can assist in the uphill battle uh, that they often face in, in uh, having their, their voices heard. Thanks. Very much. That's a really good point, Juha. Okay, I'd like to ask Steve and Peter to join us, um, maybe just in your chairs. <laughs> and, um, and let's open it up. So anyone in the in-person audience, and we have some really good questions coming in online that I'll help moderate as well. But Anybody in the in-person audience who'd like to make a comment or a question, please. Yeah, please. And I think they'd like you to go to the microphones, if you don't mind, so the online audience can hear. Thank you. You guys want to come sit down? So, um, my question is on the cost of transition. You had mentioned that briefly, and I was wondering if you can elaborate on what sort of costs you know, what's the number, or what's sort of the ballpark or idea of how much it would cost to transition to get to that frontier line? Is that something realistic in your experience um, for implementing this sort of work? And what are some of the questions that people um, are asking and, and so forth? You want us just to start with some facts and then they can uh, bring us back to reality. Um, so um, what we tried to do in, 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 you know, obviously when you're transitioning from uh, agriculture to uh, restored or, you know, something into agriculture, there, there obviously there is that cost associated. So what we tried to do um, to build that in was uh, to look very carefully at the what evidence we have, like what were restoration costs in various ecosystems to get to, you know, for reforestation or for restoring grassland. So we basically harvested from the literature, like what do we know about um, what kind of capital costs, if you will, or it's kind of that uh, uh, that that cost of changing it from one thing um, to another. So that's what we added into, um, into the analysis. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our panel to talk about, you know, so if there are, you know, somebody has to pay these costs and, and typically they're upfront costs. And so, you know, it's not something you can ask a, a poor landowner to do, like, I want you to stop growing food for the next 10 years. So, um, you know, there are some real important institutional um, questions, like where, where do the resources come from? So overall, we can see 
on the, the figure. Like if, if you're moving to the right in our figure, it means that overall there's more economic return coming, but you need to make sure that the important decision makers are made whole. And that may require a set of payments or, or some types of policies. Yeah, and I think just to add quickly onto that, that the um, that the getting all the way to the frontier, especially for countries that are very far from the frontier in the current scenario, obviously is going to take massive investment to get all the way there. That's why I, I, I like the direction that Peter was taking this. We're talking about you know steps along the way that they're doing for for Paraguay and, and other of the Amazonian countries now. It's in the works. Um, because then you can start thinking about you know on, on sort of project relevant timelines, on a five year planning time frame or a fifteen year planning time frame then what are the next best, best steps you can make to move you in the right direction? And those transition costs, I think, are because they're based on numbers from the literature, they're based on the same kind of information that project planning documents rely on. They're not, we're not coming out with numbers that are radically different from what you would estimate from projects that would implement the same kind of activities um, on those, those shorter timeframes. Um, and then the other thing is that because we've estimated, you can look at the improvement in carbon storage, that carbon storage is another aspect. I'm not actually sure if the carbon value was included in the net economic returns or not, it may not. So that's actually another value that can be added and considered on top of as a way to help finance those, those costs. Well, maybe just to add to that, I think it's something that is very useful here is that it raises all these questions also. You start with a number on what is the transition cost, but then all these questions of, for example, okay, if you have this additional carbon sequestration, is there a possibility to leverage carbon markets to finance that transition? This is not providing an answer to that, but it provides some of the information necessary to start opening those discussions with the right questions. Yeah. Oh, can I follow up on, on that just quickly? I, I had a similar comment that, uh, you know, whether the uh, costs uh, seem to be uh, sensible, of, of course, depends on the benefits and uh, uh, understanding something about the climate benefits and maybe the biodiversity benefits of their economic value can be, can be, can be helpful. In this regard, so there's a question whether in in uh, your transition uh, uh, work and, and future work you've thought about using uh, monetary values on the benefit side also to guide uh, the analysis here. And then what, maybe one final thing I, I wanted to mention on on this uh, global biodiversity framework is that um, I think there's a recognition that uh, we need to add funding to conservation from domestic sources, from international sources, and 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 from private sources. So just yesterday, uh, Global Environmental Facility, Jeff uh, um, Council approved a Global Biodiversity Fund that is, will be the, uh, the first uh, key step in, in mobilizing funding to, uh, to promote conservation uh, of biodiversity, especially in, uh, in developing countries. So it's a one, I think 1.8 billion in that range, uh, but um, maybe not sufficient, but, uh, but an important next step. Thanks. Thank you. And then we have Gianni. May We'll take the people at the microphone. Thank you. Very quickly, just to, to complement uh, what Juha just said, in China, we, we tried to, to mimic what it is uh, cost-benefit analysis of the different scenarios. And for the, for the cost part, of course, we look at the cost of the transition for the, to, 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 the, to the scenarios we looked at. And for the benefit part, we used the, the concept of gross ecological product that China has developed which basically puts many economic and environmental values into a production function framework and, and generates a, a number that gives you a, a sense of what are the economic benefits of, uh, of implementing different scenarios. And, and what came out of the analysis, Joa, you will be super happy, is that the most, uh, uh, the highest cost benefit ratio is the scenario that maximizes carbon subject to the 30 by 30 target. Uh, because of the of the co-benefits that come in terms of other ecosystem services that come with that. Uh, so you get less carbon sequestration uh, because you have an additional constraint, but but you get other benefits, which if you are able to monitor, as you were saying, uh, then then can can change the balance. Over. Thank you, John. That's great. 
And I'll come back to you because there's a question related to the UNCA online, and I think the GEP connection is a great one there. But I have two questions in the room that we'd like to honor first, and then we'll come back to you, Johnny. So please. Again, thank you. And um, with uh, apologies for being a eminently practical approach person, um, I'm wondering if there are any, if you're thinking about, I am, um, micro examples, because I, I find in, in whether it is global leadership decisions or, or US-based or any one country-based, it's much easier to wrap arms around something if there is an example of, for instance, uh, green industrial agricultural options alongside of others of other natural capital and nature-based solutions along with, well, you know, we could we could pie in the sky. But it's a way of demonstrating the economic engine behind both uh, keeping the, the natural carbon and the natural ecosystems intact, as well as allowing a, a new form of capital to form based perhaps on the carbon or greenhouse gas side of the measurement. And are, is anyone seeing the, the carbon market bringing additive value and additive finance as she's asking to some of these more, you know, in the context of regenerative agriculture or integrated watershed management, things like that? Yeah, Juha, please. Thanks. That's a great, uh, great question. There is a um, quite a lot of uh, evidence and experience at the local level that supports the idea of uh, of uh, investing in restoration and conservation of nature. So uh, at IUCN, uh, you know, we've been working and, and with many partners on uh, especially forest and, and, and landscape restoration, where in many cases uh, investments in improving or kind of reducing the degradation of uh, soils and, and land, land in general can uh, bring in re returns through agriculture, especially, and through other economic activities that will eventually outweigh the expenses, even at the local level. So these are best oftentimes uh, conducted as analysis at the landscape, local landscape level, because that's where the uh, community who's working on this and, and, and the impacts are and the beneficiaries. The challenge there, of course, is, is, is oftentimes the liquidity, that those communities don't necessarily have the upfront uh, capacity, the capacity to invest upfront. And there, this kind of approach can be very effective in uh, working, for instance, with bi bilateral, multilateral donors, uh, and, and sometimes private sector to bring in that funding that then in the end, uh, you know, will break even or, 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 or beyond. But quite a lot of work on uh, in, in that area. We, we call it the restoration opportunities assessment methodology, and it it's kind of the micro scale assessment of what the, what what has been done here at the national level and and uh, and global level. Thanks. Uh, um, Adrian is one of the architects of that restoration, the Rome methodology. Yeah, with a number of other people, but that's a great example. Yeah, we have another question here, please. And then we have a bunch online that I'll turn to. Now Kessler with the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Thank you and congratulations to all the panelists and authors. This is an incredible body of work that will be so useful in so many conversations and guiding them. Um, my question is with regard to the frontiers and whether my very basic understanding of them is that they're maximizing efficiency for economic and environment. And is it already included or do they go far enough to curb the climate change and biodiversity crises? So if we are able to inform policies such that all countries are looking to move into this frontier, everybody gets there in magical lump sums of money and policy, have we gone far enough to actually create something sustainable or have we just sort of slowed the eventual demise? <laughs> <laughs> That is the question, isn't it? No, it's a great question, and it's something that um, you know is motivating this work. And I know uh, you know C Carl and some of his comments, and you know, thinking about um, the transformation that is needed in order to actually make this 
maintain a livable planet, not just for us, but for other species. Um, so, you know, one way of thinking about this is this is this is what the um, you know most of this is 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 done at the national level, and it's it's basically saying you know what can a country do in order to improve its biodiversity, in order to improve its carbon sequestration. Um, on the biodiversity side, you know, Yuha has already spoken about, you know, 30 by 30 and, you know, so we could, we can put, and, and Gianni talked about, you know, we can put constraints on the analysis and say, we think we need to, you know, get to 30 by 30, or we need to uh, put on. So um, the analysis can be done, in fact, with that. And I think here is a case where actually, if I can blend your question with the prior one, you know, the prior one is like, Look, show me a story that works here, and and but then scaling it up is like, but we need all of these local stories to actually scale up so that we address a global problem. Um, and um, on the carbon side, so so I think I'm, I'll hold off on biodiversity, and, and you how you should come back on this one. But you know, on on the carbon side, of course, what we're talking about with nature-based solutions or, you know, the, the natural uh, climate uh, solutions, this is only a portion of the problem, right? I mean, so we can sequester carbon in natural systems, but, you know, that doesn't offset, like, even if we did all of the things to get to the frontier here, that doesn't offset the um, emissions for more than you know, somewhere it's less than a decade. So it's it's a part of the solution on carbon, but it's certainly not the whole thing. But I, we also have one of the architects, I believe, Carl Folke of the planetary boundaries concept. And so I could just wanted to say, I, I could see a, a, a nice next step would be a union of this approach of the frontiers with the planetary boundaries to try and address exactly that question. So it'd be super interesting. If I, I just, I want, I can go back to that question. It's just, th this question uh, is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the Amazon work, because we, uh, the, the current work says, what is Colombia with, the, with its resources? How close it is uh, the country to the efficiency frontier? And what's the best they can do or how to move closer to that efficiency frontier of the country? But we know that the Amazon is a global public good, right? So there are many benefits that go beyond Colombia, that go beyond even the 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 from the geography of the Amazon basin. So then this is where we can start thinking about okay, what will it how how can we think about constraints that actually preserve so much of the Amazon because we know that it's a global objective that brings benefits for everybody. So including these constraints is, is one of the reasons why, why we're so excited. Really good point. Okay, there's, an, there's a couple of questions, a lot of good ones we're not gonna get to here. We'll, we'll do our best to address these online. But there's one that's really interesting that's gonna be for you, Carl. Um, and that is a combination of it's related to Yuha's points about resource mobilization. So the question is around financial incentives. So what sorts of financial incentives might there be for the private sector, for example, to start driving some of this change that's needed to take the steps towards the frontier? And related to that, which is also something you think a lot about and have working towards is how, what actions are we taking to change mindsets and what should we be doing differently or more of? So would you like to take that on Carl and then we'll pass it around a little? Yeah, I can try, I can try a to, to start a little bit there on the financial one. I think that at least in the country I live in here in Sweden and in Europe, there is an enormous uh, awakening and action actually going on in the business sector. Uh, that that I've been working with these issues since the early '80s, and I, I, I've been quite shocked about the speed of it, actually. And 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 that's very positive, I think. And and, and I think the reason is pure, 
basically that uh, there's a recognition that uh, we are moving out of the the conditions we have had during my lifetime to a new situation of the Anthropocene where we have to do things in different ways and, and, and generate new purposes. So I can see a lot of a lot of financial investors and business adding adding a purpose of sustainability in a deep sense and not just as a com compliance thing, but more as a conviction for for this is the new space where where good business will take place in the future. And I, I find that very exciting and interesting. And, that, and that's part of the of this mind mind shift, of course. Uh, another dimension that, I, that I've been thinking about listening to this discussion is, is to what extent the significance of, for example, uh, re we call it response diversity that biodiversity provides uh, is, is, can be part of their approach given, 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 the, given the combined shocks that we are living with now that are completely new uh, in many dimensions. Uh, we often say that we are not just uh, in a situation where the game is changing, but the whole playing field for the game. And we, we know that there are areas due to climate change that do have uh, will have very different patterns of rainfall or different climate situations uh, that will cause migration patterns between nations and things like that. To what extent are the, these type of insurance building dimensions can they or they or can they be represented in this nature frontiers approach uh, to further highlight the significance of, of revitalizing the biosphere that we're part of thank you yeah it's actually a wonderful i think closing um set of remarks um for this panel thank you carl and thank you to all the panel members and also the audience in person and online. Um, we really appreciate your engagement. And um, we now are really honored to have some closing remarks from, from Valerie. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost my, oh yeah, she's here, great. Thank you for joining us so much, Valerie. Valerie Hickey is the Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources and Blue Economy at the World Bank. And you have some wonderful instruments behind you. Um, but we're really happy to have you and um, interested to hear your closing remarks for this, for this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And I won't embarrass myself or the whole world by trying to play my, my remarks on a guitar. I think that might lead us all to run away screaming. But I wanted to say a huge thank you to you, to Adrian, to Peter, to Steve, to Jenny, to Carl, to Adrian, to Nancy, to Juha, and also to Richard Demania, who isn't here with us, but who has been our intellectual North Star on this work within the World Bank. You know, as I was listening to the conversation today, and uh, as I read the report and watched this come to fruition over the last couple of years, four things have really struck me today. The first is talking about environment is no longer the realm of just environmental scientists or people with mud on boots. It's not a hippy dippy, nice to have tree hugging discussion. This is serious economics. This is serious business. And that matters. I think the second thing that I really heard today, and this speaks to the challenge that Anna raised when she opened this meeting today, is how much this report signals a paradigm shift. You know, for so long, we've been told over and over again that nature has to be sacrificed on the altar of development, because it's the only way for countries to grow. It's the only way to feed people is if we sacrifice nature. And it's not true. All of us around this table today, uh, both in, in real life and virtually, know that isn't true. The numbers tell us it isn't true. You know, just this year, 828 million people are going to bed hungry. 58 million people in 58 countries are starving, starving in 2023. And that's happening despite nature being degraded and deforested. When we think about low-income countries, a third of them have not regained their income per capita today at the same level as they had in 2019, despite increasing and accelerated illegal deforestation. 
just last year, we've just seen the reports come out in 2022, illegal deforestation was 10% larger than in 2021. We're increasing deforestation. We ended up deforesting last year, 4 million hectares, 16,000 square miles, the same, uh, an area the size of Switzerland. And yet, 58 million people are starving to death. And yet, the income of low-income countries has remained low and is getting lower. And yet, the incomes of middle-income countries, if you take China out of the equation, have stalled against their high-income counterparts. So instinctually, and when it comes to data, we know that this either-or agenda, either you can have nature or you can have growth, isn't true because both of them are failing. And this either or agenda, and you has spoke so, so eloquently about this, has to change. This idea that either we talk about economics or we talk about environmental science, clearly this report shows that we need both. When we talk about either we work with far farmers on the landscape or we work with indigenous peoples and local communities is wrong. Most indigenous people are farmers. All farmers are part of their local community. And all of them make up the landscape across which ecosystem services flow and across which agricultural productivity matters. It's not an either or agenda. We get told all the time and we talk now, either we focus on the 30 by 30 agenda target through under the global biodiversity framework, or we talk about food security. Again, wrong. It's both. We have to take a ridge to reef approach. We have to look across conservation and sustainable production. It's not an either or agenda. And my personal pet pet peeve, pet peeve, either everybody talks about public finance and the need to provide concessional financing for environment, or everybody's talking about private capital and that private money is going to rush to the rescue of environment. The truth is we need both and we need to, to marry the two so public finance can unlock private finance so that we can finance more green things, but we can also green finance. So this idea that we live in a world of either or, where either we have environment or we have economics, we know it's wrong, the data shows it's wrong, and we have to stop talking about either or. It's a both and agenda. The third thing that really hit me is just how much this report has created a message that will be so easily digestible. Because we all know that how we message something is as important as what we're saying. And in this case, it's how much this report and the work that's behind it is narrating itself as an efficiency and affordability agenda. It's in the title of the report. And efficiency and affordability have never been more important in a world where 60% of our low-income clients are in debt distress or at risk of going into debt distress. It's never been more important to have an efficiency agenda at a time when the supply of money has been reduced and the cost of money has gone up. Over a quarter of emerging markets countries no longer have access to the capital markets in effect. And for countries rated as C-rated borrowers, their costs of borrowing just since last February 2022 have gone up over 14%. So efficiency is the watchword for today. And talking about this report and talking about how we must marry both the environment and the economics and the economic growth and the development agenda together and wrapping it up in an efficiency wrapping is absolutely critical. And then the final thing that really struck me from the report, from the work that underpins it and from the discussion we had today is that it's important to have the data. It's important to have a message that makes that data digestible, but then it's important to tell people, so what? What do you do about it? And that's important. What's the roadmap to countries reaching that production frontier? And that's what's been so important about this work is the discussions around how do you build regulation and policy that matters, especially policies on incentives, particularly policies around subsidies. What are the institutions you need to make this work? What about the public infrastructure and the incentives to build it? What about access to finance? 
And that matters, laying out a roadmap for how, without it being overly prescriptive, without forgetting that there are trade-offs in reaching the frontier, really, really matters. And so I really want to thank everybody for doing the incredible work to, that went into this report, but into the many other reports and the many dialogues and the many discussions. This report in today's conversation is just one more whistle stop on what has been a long train journey over many, many years now with all of the partners around the table that proves that we simply cannot have a world without poverty in a world without nature. So thank you so very much, Mary, and congratulations again to everybody who put this together. Applause to you, Valerie, and to everybody for the work, for your interest being here in person, and those of you online. It's really clear to me that we can now show what's possible in this integrated agenda that Valerie, you just articulated so beautifully. And now we need to get to work to help people see how to get there and also how to change this narrative. So I think we're on a good path and we have wonderful people whose shoulders are to that wheel. So yeah, thank you very much everyone for joining. We will be in touch online with follow-ups, but before we sign off, I wanted to thank Isabel and Ilana and Lori and Mary Jane for all of the wonderful support for making this hybrid event happen. So thank you all very much. Okay, good evening and good morning and good afternoon. <laughs>